our appetite for electronics is insatiable. I don't have to show you this image of people breaking through the glass at T-Mobile, the T-Mobile store on the Brixton High Street um, two years ago during the riots, um, but I will. <laughs> and um, I probably don't have to tell you that by the year 2020, each one of us in this room will have consumed and disposed of 178 kilos of electricals, which is, I don't know, yeah, um, maybe three times me in weight. I mean, that's, that's a lot. Um, and I probably also don't have to show you this photo of where some of our e-waste ends up. It's illegal, but it does sometimes end up in dumps like this in Ghana. Um, it's toxic. The, the, what's in it is toxic. And over the last couple of years, um, I started really reflecting. I love living in London. London is a great place in terms of people's consciousness, their awareness of the rest of the world, their interest in issues like food, uh, like transport and energy. Um, the same people who are so concerned, who are going to the farmer's market for their uh, ethical food, uh, who are concerned about those plastic carrier bags. These are people who I would see replacing their laptop every year, or um, uh, replacing their mobile every nine months. And I really started to wonder, like, why is it with electronics, electricals, that we have this idea that we can really, in the sentence, we can calm our conscience as long as we recycle it, um, it's going to be okay. And don't get me wrong, I really love electronics. I, um, I like what these iPads and iPhones can do. They're brilliant. But I really would not be happy if every single mobile and every single laptop were recycled. There's just, for me, there's just something that doesn't sit right. It doesn't seem right, the way we're consuming technology. Um, so. Um, there's this, do you remember, there were three R's. <laughs> they taught you in school about recycling, perhaps. But there used to be three R's. There was this, um, this reducing and reusing, and they're often forgotten. So uh, last year, I started this project with a friend of mine um, who also had a lot of the same anxieties and concerns. And our idea was to bring the focus back to those forgotten R's. Um, thinking about how we can reduce and reuse our electronics. And one of the first things we did was go to a recycling center in a, a London borough, which I won't name. Um, and we went over to that, it's, a, it's called the Pink Skip. It's the place where you responsibly dispose of your electronics. It's a recycling place. Um, it's this big uh, pink container, I call it. Um, and we looked inside, we peeked inside, and we saw lots of things that, to be honest, still looked quite functional. I mean, okay, maybe they were old, but we could see that some of the stuff in there was still functional. But the thing that actually um, scared us and horrified us the most was when we saw someone bring a laptop, which, you know, either of us probably could have got back working again. The guy arrives with a laptop and somebody, uh, one of the employees of the recycling center, literally asked this person to smash the laptop so that it was recyclable. In other words, um, so that they could be sure that it was going to be recycled. And this really had us pause. You know, we're thinking, wait, what's going on here? Um, and it turns out the statistics show that 23% of electronics that are taken for disposal are either still functional or are economically repairable. And so this was kind of disturbing for us the more we thought about it. Um, and so um, we, wa we asked why, you know, there must be some kind of economic interest in this, like the smashing, the, the recycling. And it's true that global elites like these guys in suits in Davos, they're actually quite concerned with recycling and with um, what's been termed the circular economy. Um, I'm going to show you a diagram of the circular economy. This is my little diagram. Now, the guys in the suits, they're really interested in the outer circle that outer circle, which is a highly resource intensive, it's, it's, it's only, it's, it, to crush something, to recycle it, takes a lot of energy. And it's really only feasible at scale. So it makes sense that corporations and, um, and are interested in this, because you know, in the end, they are gonna be the only ones who are going to be able to collect everything and mine, literally mine, the minerals and the material, the, the metals that are in them. But what about those other two circles uh, there in the middle? One of them is kind of remanufacture, reuse, 
And the other one, the little white one there, that's repair. Um, and well, we started to think about, you know, what's happening to repair? We've lost our repair muscles. So what we did last year is we started running what we call restart parties. These are community events. They're free. They last about three hours. Um, and we invite our, we've invited guys, mostly guys, so women, if you're interested, please contact me. Um, these guys are volunteers. They have skills with electronics. Um, they f they're fearless. They'll open anything and help repair anything. But the idea is it's not a free repair, that you, with, with your sad electronics or your broken electronics, you get involved. You help open it up, you help troubleshoot, and you learn something from the process. Um, we may not fix everything we get, but we definitely learn something every time we open a device. You learn about bad design, you learn about maybe how to be a better consumer next time. So we've run about, we ran about 27 of these. Um, and we engaged, you know, hundreds of Londoners. Um, hundreds of Londoners felt really empowered opening up their stuff. You can see the kind of stuff we fix. Laptops, printers, PC towers, p uh, DVD players. Uh, people bring everything, throw everything at us, and we're willing to try and fix anything. I'll give you an example here. This um, was down the road in Hernhill Market. Um, it's a beautiful coffee grinder from a German manufacturer who I'm not going to uh, <laughs> compliment, uh, but, you know, good, uh, good manufacturing, probably 15, 20 years old. It took us forever to figure out what was wrong with the motor. And we had a couple volunteers who were actually kind of sharing skills. And, um, and the owner of this coffee grinder also stuck around. She learned a lot about the assembly of this thing. And yes, we did fix it in the end. Um, of the owners here, please tell us if it's still working. Um, but I want to tell you a slightly more personal story so you can get what this feels like when you actually take back control of your device, and you can maybe get a feeling for what that inner circle could look like um, in a sustainable future economy. Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Oh, here we are. Okay, so I was late to the smartphone craze. <laughs> I got this one about a year and a half ago, and I, you know, I really wanted buttons. Call me crazy, I'm old school, I wanted buttons. Um, but what I realized shortly after getting this phone is that it had some problems. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, the, the browser would crash. I couldn't, the email wouldn't refresh properly. I couldn't even install apps on it. And I'm thinking, why did I get a smartphone if it can't be smart? And so my friends told me, oh, it's a memory problem. And so we found a way to cope with it. And we found a way I can, you know, delete the cache, all these things. There was actually no coping. This device was shipped in a way that was basically unusable. It's, it's software and it's hardware were configured in a way that would have me literally recycle it in a couple of months. So. I was not about to accept this situation. We, I took this to a couple of restart parties. Um, we tried to wipe the, the firmware, the, op the operating system clean. Didn't get anywhere. I went home for Christmas, and my brother, who's super technical, after some eggnog, he went on all these forums, you know, full of super geeky stuff, like Android developer forums, and I'm like, Ugh. And he said, look, this is going to take hours, days, to figure out the exact configuration for your phone. And I'm thinking, you know, well, it's not going to happen now. So I tried again. We failed, wiped out all of my data. I lost all my contacts, and I was super despairing until um, I discovered Ben, one of our volunteers, has the same funky, weird Android. And he spent that amount of time that my brother had predicted on the forums trying to find the right software. And he shows this victorious screen of how he's reset his phone. He saved the phone. Such a nice object. He saved it. And I'm thinking, yes, OK. So um, down the road from here, um, a couple of weeks, a couple months ago, two months ago, this was my moment of glory. Ben helped me reinstall the firmware, the operating system on my phone. And you can see, uh, maybe you can't see here, but anyway, I have lots of memory all of a sudden. My phone is new. My phone is mine. And I'm telling you, there's something really, really empowering about that moment. Um, when you take back something, I didn't ever want to get rid of this phone. I wanted this phone, I still will want this phone for years, and now I can use it. N now I decide when I dispose of it. it it's mine. And that for me, this is like true ownership. Um, and it's a super empowering moment. Now, let's go back to that inner circle, okay? What if, th this is what, this is what we're, we're getting, to, getting to now. What if you could find Ben every time you needed him? 
okay? What, you know, I'm pretty sure no repair store would be willing to do what Ben did. I mean, that's, who would spend hours and days like that on those forums? It's just not worth it. But what if, it, what if every time you had a problem like that, you could find Ben? You could go to a restart party like ours, you, he could help you there, or even better, you could arrange to meet Ben at a cafe, and you could say you could maybe pay him in cake, or you could pay him in cash, or you could pay him in the Brixton pound, for example. Um, but just to say that this inner circle, the repair, this is about person-to-person -person interaction. This is about the power of people connecting and helping each other. Um, we haven't figured out what a future circular economy will look like. And those guys in suits, they're, you know, they're really committed to figuring out the recycling part, keeping those metals in that loop. But we need to think about what this is gonna look like. What does a more resilient um, repair economy look like? I'm pretty sure it's pretty local. I'm pretty sure it involves finding people who care, who have specialized skills, who are willing to reach out to their neighbors. So I just wanna leave you with this idea that, um, that when you hear more about the circular economy, and you will increasingly, because the media is interested in that outer circle, let's remember that there's an inner circle, that, that repair and remanufacture and reuse is just as important as you going to the pink skip. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>